This is a piece from Sea Change by Stephen Lowe. My grandfather was injured by a horse that ran wild at the landing at Gallipoli. Its belly had been ripped open by the barbed wire hidden under the surface of the water. Somehow, in all that carnage, his comrades got him on a Red Cross ship. He thought he was lucky, on his way back to Devon to recuperate. Heaven. The ship was bombed, not far from here. It sank in a clear glass sea. Not one of those stormy days that Ulysses beat his way through. Ideal holiday weather. Of course, a Red Cross should not have been attacked. Geneva Conventions. But both sides by this time were running arms and fresh troops under its flag. His ship, however, was a real thing, not sailing under false colours. But he and many others had to pay the price for the deceit of generals as always, as much as known history. As the water poured into his ward, a nurse tried to calm him. Although she must be terrified herself. She wiped his sweat away and gave him a sip of clear water. He thought this gesture absurd as the water rose around their feet. Absurd, but fine. He loved her so much in that moment that it hurt him more than his injury. She didn't try to escape. Perhaps there was no escape. Perhaps it never crossed her mind. That he'd never know. Just as he'd never know if anyone survived. As the first wave of water hit them, she freed his arms, but not his legs. The screams of the dying men were echoing against the broken skin of the ship. He hung around her neck, holding on. The second wave covered them. They held their bursting breath. But that last air doesn't last into eternity. And so they gulped in the water as, as though they'd wandered in from out of a desert. And he thought in that torrent that so suddenly became a silent pool. He thought he could see tears trickling down her face. He knew this to be crazy. How could you see such a thing with all that water around you? And even if there were tears, what did it matter to either of them or to anybody else? They were dead anyway. I'm going to be reading a section from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. The cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good natured, so she thought. Still, it had very sharp claws and, and a great many teeth. So she felt it ought to be treated with respect. <clears throat> Cheshire Push, she began rather timidly, for she did not know whether it would like the name. However, it only grinned a little wider. Come, it's pleased so far, thought Alice. And she went on. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a great deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. Oh, I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. Alice felt this could not be denied. So she tried another question. 
sort of people live about here? In that direction, said the cat, waving its right paw around, lives a hatter. And in that direction, waving its other paw, lives a March hare. Visit either if you like. They're both mad. But I don't want to go among mad people, Alice remarked. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. How do you know I'm mad, said Alice. Oh, you must be, said the cat. Or you wouldn't have come here. Alice didn't think that proved it at all. However, she went on. And how do you know you're mad? To begin with, said the cat, a dog's not mad. You grant that. I suppose so, said Alice. Oh, well, then, said the cat. You see, a dog growls when it's angry and it wags its tail when it's pleased. Now I growl when I'm pleased and I wag my tail when I'm angry. Therefore, I'm mad. I call it paring, not growling, said Alice. Call it what you like, said the cat. <laughs> Do you play croquet with the queen today? I should like it very much, said Alice, but I haven't been invited yet. Oh, you'll see me there, said the cat, and vanished. <laughs> The piece I'm going to read is The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. No. I feel new. The blood coursing through my dilated veins is new blood, newly pumped and completely fresh from my beating heart. I feel fresh, newly made, as if I were made fresh from the earth itself. So natural, so pure, so good, so vibrant. But I am not. I can feel it. I can feel the evil streaming stillfully through my arteries, flowing throughout my body, my mind, my soul. It is there. It has always been there. But now it is stronger. I can feel its strength. I feel beautiful. There is pain. It is purely physical. It is simply my body adjusting to its new form. The old muscles straining and becoming young. My mind more alive. I can feel it. The pain is beautiful. There is nothing I cannot handle. Henry Jekyll, however, would be writhing in pain. His old limbs shaking, thin lips trembling, unable to cope. Ha! Pathetic. The transformation I underwent was in all probability the most beautiful, the most horrific thing I'd ever experienced in my five decades of living. How am I to describe it? Pure agony it was, beyond my control. But now, the aftermath, the result of what I am left with, I am in absolute unrestricted control. The pain, the agony, it was completely worth it. I'm unsure what my physical appearance is like. Do I resemble a monster? For I've heard many stories of men and women taking potions and disfiguring. But I am sure, I am sure that I am beautiful, for I feel beautiful, and monsters do not feel beautiful. But not beautiful, then smaller, much smaller than Henry Jekyll, and my mind is more wider than anyone's could ever be. What should it matter how I look? I take pride in myself, whatever my physical attributes may be. Henry Jekyll is gone. I am better. I am so much better. Perhaps I should locate a mirror, for I must know what I look like. 
But to this date, there is still no mirror in my chamber, which I regret after hours of hard work, after the excruciating pain, the excitement to see myself must be contained, for I do not own a mirror in my chamber. Perhaps I will see myself soon. I wish to, for I must look beautiful. Henry Jekyll is gone, and in his place is I, Mr. Edward Hyde. New. <laughs> Witch Witch by Alan Melville. It's many a year since I launched my career in Shakespeare. At the most tender age, I tottered on stage as a page. I was with Johnny G in, now let me see, 43. Larry was such a dear, and I carried a spear in his leer. <laughs> ah, those were the days, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, but last week, a fringe group from Clacton-on-Sea asked me to tour its non-equity rules. You sleep in the van and play prisons and schools for 89 weeks as a witch in Macbeth. A prospect I thought little better than death. But as I'd grown tired of just giving auditions, I said I would do it on certain conditions. I told the director, my dear, there is one point on which I'm not clear. We fixed up the sordid finance, so to speak, and I'm working for practically nothing a week. But in which part am I to appear? Which which? Is it first which or second? Witch, as one who's played Lady Macbeth in her day, I must be the witch with the most lines to say. The tall, scraggy, thin one does not interest me. I must be the hag with a gag in Act Three. <laughs> if it's the first witch, dear, I should love it. But if it's the second, you know where you can shove it. The second witch part is of slender repute. Though it's got one good line, could I say, I of Newt? To avoid any last minute hitch, would you kindly inform me which, which? Yes, before I pack one single bag, I must know in advance, dear, which hag. There's only one crone, dear, which frankly will do. And I don't mean crone three, and I don't mean crone two. It would save some expense if you didn't have three. Why not lump them together and only have me? Do you know, dear, I think it would work if I were to say nose of Turk and that bit about drabs in a ditch. I just want to know, dear, which rattled old crow, dear, which, which? And another thing, dear, would you care to explain what the witches will wear? <laughs> he said nothing. They're nude, not a stitch. So I never discovered which, which. <laughs> This is a play called Time Out of Mind by Wayne Drew. A single scheme to flee my fate and save my life. That was the plan. And with Tom Walsingham's dear aid, we soon secured three foul men who in the darkness would assist. One came for great advancement, the other two simply for hard cash. And thus, that grim unholy crew they set to work to liberate me nine whole days i waited there in no small fear i do admit till they procured the body stiff of some poor murdered wretch no older than myself he was who'd been done to death oh by others hands i'm most relieved to say <laughs> at least that's what i'm told and i never dared to question it kit marlowe's murdered in a tavern brawl Yes, that is what was said by all. 
The ugly rumor set abroad that the wretched deed was done by a bawdy serving man. A rival in a love affair was most offensive and untrue, especially if thou saw the hideous wretch. And if I were now still alive and met the perpetrators vile of such base nonsense scurrilous, I'd deal with them. Yes, that I would. And thus a poor wretch's corpse was substitute, his body for my own. A deed that then confused it all, the jury, judge, and entourage. And so the corpse was fast conveyed, all hugger-mugger, and quick placed in a dank, unmarked grave in the churchyard of St. Nick's in Detford Town. Oh, a sordid spot at the best of times that Detford is, and at the worst. Well, best not think on it. Still, I was left quite free at last to make a hasty and uh, concealed retreat to where thou findest me right now. And here Kit Marlowe sits, newborn as Walter Hart.